from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. This is Update One, the club's official podcast. It features newsworthy stories originating from the NPC facilities, as well as broader topics related to journalism, communications, press freedom, and transparency. I'm Tom Young with the National Press Club's Broadcast Committee in Washington. Military Veterans in Journalism, MVJ, is a group founded in 2019 by Navy veteran Zach Badorf and Marine Corvette Russell Midori. MVJ's primary mission is to get more military veterans into newsrooms, but that's not its only role. The group has launched an effort to fight the spread of disinformation and extremism in the military community. I'm on the phone with Zach Badorf. Full disclosure, Zach is a member of American Legion Post 20, which is affiliated with the National Press Club, and I am Post 20's commander. I also happen to be a member of MVJ. Zach, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks so much. Uh, well, first of all, Zach, tell us about your military background and why you helped create Military Veterans in Journalism. Yeah, so I was very lucky to have been a Navy journalist from 2001 to 2006. And so I was doing storytelling about the military for the military in the public affairs community. And uh, so that meant that I did stories um, about um, the Navy, uh, Coast Guard, Army, Marine Corps, in places like Kwajalein Atoll, Philippines, across Japan, uh, Alaska, and also when I was um, on a ship based out of San Diego, floated around the Gulf and did some stories about the Navy Marine Corps missions and, and life on, on board ship. So um, I took those skills that I had, those those experiences, that understanding of the military and, and the, the that, that whole community and that life, and I thought that I would take my experience and uh, transition into civilian journalism, you know, reporting for news outlets, um, it had always been something that appealed to me. So I tr- got out of the military and started applying for jobs. And uh, it was a real struggle. You know, the transition was very rough. Uh, you know, I applied for dozens and dozens of jobs across the country. And I don't think I even got one interview. Um, oh, wow. And part of the problem was, you know, uh, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a network. I didn't really know what I was doing on how to make that jump into civilian journalism, despite having, at that point, a bachelor's in journalism and a pretty decent reel and, um, you know, some pretty solid, tangible skills, five years of work experience. But it was, as I said, it was rough. Not a sad story at the end of the day. I I, I freelanced uh, across the nation, across the world, um, focusing on national security, foreign policy. Uh, Most recently, uh, I freelanced and and reported for the New York Times, Associated Press, The Guardian, other outlets like that, while living and working in the Central African Republic. And um, I'm not doing news reporting anymore, but I am supporting my fellow vets. I know that transition. I've been through it myself. And I know that veterans are also vastly underrepresented in the media world. If you look at the veteran population, as we know, 7.5% of Americans have served, but in newsrooms across the United States, it's only about 2% of journalists who are that. So we're working to correct that disparity as, as through the organization Military Veterans in Journalism. We are, broadly speaking, looking to get that into news. And um, my co-founder and I, we, we created it out of an organic need that we discovered because we are both veterans who went through that that transition of getting into civilian journalism. We know that veterans deserve a voice in the national conversation around military and veteran affairs. And, you know, it just it brings diversity. It brings expertise. And the more veterans that you have, the quality of reporting on, on these issues is just going to go up and up. So that's really a fight that we're, we're leading every day. It's a passion project for both of us, and we have a small team that supports our efforts. We've been very lucky to have some tremendous partners uh, over the past few years since we founded the organization in 2019. We've had about 15 some fellowships so far, and we have another 10 or so this coming year. 
So we're really expanding. We've got a lot of great programs, a lot of great services for members. And if there's any veterans who are listening, I'd encourage them to go to our website, uh, www.mvj.network, and uh, sign up and become a member. There's a lot a lot we can do to support vets on their journey into journalism. Wow, it sounds like you're making a lot of good progress. I see that you've also tried to fight messaging by the terror group ISIS in past work. Tell me about how that influenced your decision to lead a new effort to combat disinformation in the veteran and military communities. I've sort of gone and worked in different fields around, centered around communication and journalism, always focusing back on national security, coming back to that service component that is why a lot of us got into the military. And so uh, one thing that I worked on project for a few years was um, working to counter ISIS as well as al-Shabaab propaganda. And, you know, what I saw in, in that and in speaking to former ISIS members, you know, going to northeast Syria to interview those who were detained, um, um, you know, was that the propaganda works. You know, it is really powerful. When they, uh, when these terror groups put out this information, you know, they present this idealized version of what life is going to be like. They talk about um, an altered, totally inaccurate version of Islam. Um, you know, they, but they don't talk about the reality of what it's like to be in these terrorist groups. You know, it doesn't, doesn't talk about what life was like under ISIS when it ruled a big chunk of Iraq and Syria. It was, it was really harsh. And, um, but the propaganda convinced people that, in fact, that was a lie spread by the West that is anti-Islamic. Um, and so, you know, what I, I came to realize in, in doing this research, we, we created counter-narratives, as they're known, taking the voices of these former extremists who are, have been through it, know the reality, have uh, some trust, you know, they've actually lived through it, and can share messages to get to the truth of the matter. Um, and I also realized that, you know, a lot of these terror groups, when they're trying to recruit members, or trying to get in additional money, they go after vulnerable people, people who are going through perhaps a transition in their lives, perhaps they have some mental health issues, um, maybe they're being discriminated against in their communities, which is the case for many um, Muslims in Europe, for example, who went in large numbers to join ISIS. So um, they go after these people, and then they, they really target them to join and to bring that credibility that they have with them. So in last year, there were a number of reports, a number of researchers who have started to look into um, and even beyond before that, um, how veterans are being targeted by violent extremist organizations domestically here in the United States. So we know that organizations like Oath Keepers, uh, like Patriot Front, that they want veterans in their ranks because they want those military skills. They want bomb making, marksmanship, they also want the softer skills like leadership um, and um, the ability to be trusted messengers within their communities. Additionally, we know that veterans, when they come into organizations, they bring that additional level of credibility and trust and respect from the outside so that they, they, these organizations are not stupid. They know what a veteran can bring to the table when they come and they talk and they speak publicly or or they're talking with their community members, they're recruiting more people, they're leading in within their ranks. And so that's why they're, that's one of the reasons, those are some of the reasons why they're targeting veterans. And they're trying to bring them into the fold um, to commit violent actions. And so given that, uh, you know, I have this background in, in countering disinformation, I also teach in, at NYU on the subject and, um, I've done some research for NATO uh, on Russian propaganda. So, you know, I have this background. I'm at this interesting intersection of philanthropy, of the media world. Um, I have the military veteran background. I know the community. I thought maybe there's something we can do to bring all these forces together, along with the tech world, which is an important piece of this, and try to, you know, 
create something that can counter this, to protect our community, to inoculate them from the sort of in- disinformation that exists out there by, that is being propagated by these extremist groups. So our program was created. It's essentially uh, creating a journalism beat around uh, disinformation and violent extremism and within the military and veteran communities. And, and so we're just launching. We're actually hiring right now for uh, several reporters that are going to be working directly for Military Times. Uh, and then the reporting will be uh, conducted and, and, and shared with Task and Purpose, with Military.com, as well as with the Associated Press for more of a national spread for bigger stories. So we're very lucky to have launched this in, in partnership with um, – the Knight Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, as well as Craig Newmark Philanthropies, some great organizations who stepped up um, to support and work on this. And, and so we're very excited to, to move forward on this project. So it sounds like I'm hearing a through line here, uh, some similarities between your work against ISIS and this new project to combat extremism on the home front. Totally, yeah. And, and part of the the, the challenge for us is thinking through how can we communicate people to people when they're stuck in an information silo? I think that's one of the huge challenges of our media landscape today is the trust levels. Trust in media is at a, at a terrible low right now. Um, whereas on the other hand, if you look at the trust in, in the military, trust in our veteran communities, trust in veterans as messengers, Um, communicators, it's very high. So when we think about how can we relay accurate, nonpartisan, deep reporting on these groups, maybe looking at their finances, maybe looking at um, some of their political supporters, you know, what are they up to? Learning more about them and their motives and their exploitation of veterans. um, Those are the sort of questions that we want to dive into. And so that's that's similar to what we were trying to do with ISIS and al-Shabaab as well, is creating some good information flows, you know, giving them information that they can read and trust and consume um, that will make them perhaps question the information, the propaganda that's put out there. Tackling disinformation is incredibly difficult. It's a lot more easy to just put out false information or distorted information, Um, information that's intended to manipulate, to incent, you know, to invoke fear, invoke um, rage, um, lead people down a wrong path. But but fighting against it requires really a whole of society approach. It's It's a real challenge that I don't think, I haven't seen anybody really crack it, but we're giving it a go. We're trying to at least put some accurate information. And we're also going to be putting it into organizations online to try to come at them where they are, people who might be vulnerable or susceptible to this sort of information. So we'll be pushing the stories that are produced, this this nonpartisan investigative reporting into different parts of the internet. You mentioned the deliberate distortions that we find sometimes out there. Uh, What kinds of disinformation specifically are you seeing? What are, what are some of the false stories that are being deliberately propagated? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I myself uh, am not researching this particular area. Um, you know, I don't hang out in the sort of uh, dark corners of the web where a lot of this information is spread, but we are working with researchers who are. There's an organization called Task Force Butler, which I recommend that um, the listeners today check out. They're doing some really uh, cutting-edge work that, I, that, that is um, infiltrating and exposing some of the practices, some of the violent extremist actions that they're taking. Um, so a lot of it is, it's about, it, you know, this is America, right? We can believe whatever we want. You have 100% right to be racist if you want to, to me, it comes down to you can be extreme in your beliefs, but the question becomes, what do you do as a result of that? Do you, what sort of actions that you take that threaten our democracy and our republic? 
And what sort of things are you doing to harness attacks against people, whether that be online or offline? And there are a lot of offline attacks. So what is that the what are you doing with these extreme beliefs? What are these groups actually trying to do? And if you look at their actions, if you look at what Patriot Front, for example, is doing by targeting vulnerable populations and going after people and, and their racist beliefs are actually manifesting into actions in the real world, that's what we care about. You know, um, again, we're a nonpartisan organization, but we believe in the protection of our country, and we don't want this division and these extreme actions to divide our nation. Well, talking about specific actions, as we record this podcast, just very recently, the Washington Post, the Washington Post reported an example of the kind of thing you're talking about. According to the Post, a former Florida National Guard member, Brandon Russell, has been charged with plotting an attack on the electrical power grid in Maryland. And Russell is allegedly the founder of the neo-Nazi group Adam Waffen Division. And, me, and meanwhile, your um, MVJ website documents the involvement of veterans in things like the January 6th Capitol riot. So what's the, the extent of, of that problem, of veteran involvement in that kind of thing? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing and it's a nuanced thing. I, I just want to be very clear. The vast majority of veterans are not extremists. The vast majority of veterans are patriots who have served their country, uh, who, who are going about living their lives. They have nothing to do with all this nonsense that these groups are getting involved in. It's a very small minority, um, both active duty as well as um, in the veteran ranks. But, as I said, these groups are coming after us. They're targeting the veteran and military communities because they have all these things. Veterans and, and active duty folks have all these skills and values and, and, and attributes that can really contribute to their cause. So we need to stand up. We need to be able to, to fight back and, and, and be aware of, of what's going on. And that's all of what, what we're up to. So it's, it's a small percent of, of people who are actually you know, involved in, in domestic terrorism. Um, who are targeting people based on race, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, but, you know, this is our effort to try to fight back. In some ways, I can see how fighting back against this kind of disinformation could be a tough problem to tackle. Let's say I'm someone in an extremist militia. Now, in the modern media environment, I can live in my own bubble with certain cable channels mm -hmm. and podcasts and radio programs. I can just listen to stuff that supports my opinions and never hear anything I don't want to hear. So how do you break into that echo chamber? How do you reach that guy? That's, that's the challenge, right? Um, and, and maybe is it too, too late at that point? Are, are these the folks who are in the groups, are they that too far down the rabbit hole to ever be convinced? And I think a lot of it comes down to uh, trust. Who is a trusted messenger? What is a good outlet that we can count on to provide accurate information? If you don't have trust in the information you're consuming, you're going to discard it, whether you're down the rabbit hole or not. And, and so that's why we partner with Military Times, is because if you know that, that chart where it has all the different news outlets spread across the political spectrum, Military Times is right to have in the middle, right next to Associated Press. Yes, I've so seen we that wanted chart. An, we, we wanted an outlet that, that has, it is nonpartisan. We don't want people to feel like they're attacked. Um, this is a nonpartisan effort. So it's really, for us, it's about engaging people, as I said, where they are. And, and yes, that means for us, it's going to be trying to go into communities where people are potentially susceptible to this information and somehow reaching them. And that's a, that's a real challenge. So we'll, we'll do our best on that. Now, when we talk about extremism, I guess we could get into academic definitions, but what do we mean when we say extremism? At, at what point does someone's beliefs cross the line into extremism? It's a great question. It's a, it's a challenging one. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the Pentagon put together a whole working group, and they spent... Was it roughly a year trying to answer that question? 
Um, and they come up with an, a very lengthy definition that I can't remember off the top of my head. But I, but I, you know, again, they're they're trying to stay nonpartisan in this as well. It's it's a challenge. It's not like they're going to make a list, for example, of specific groups. Um, but at the same time, they have to let their commanders and their their troops know what to look out for. So how how do you define extremism? For me, again, we know that extremism is basically extreme political uh, views. It's it's fanaticism. Um, and, but for me, the most important next step beyond those views, as I expressed a moment ago, is the actions that are taken. And so if we're able to catch people while they're consuming information that perhaps would lead them down that, that rabbit hole of extremist propaganda, push them toward these extremist groups, if we're able to catch them before that happens, provide fair and accurate reporting about these groups and what they're up to, some of the, the tactics that they take, the violent actions that I would describe as anti-democratic, you know, those are the sort of things that I think we can we can really make a difference in. Before I let you go, let's return for a moment to MVJ's core mission. If I'm a news director or a managing editor about to make a hiring decision, what would you tell me about hiring a veteran? You know, as I mentioned at, at the top of this uh, chat we're having, Seven and a half percent of Americans have served in the armed forces. Um, you know, that's a huge chunk of your audience. And if you don't have a veteran on staff, and I'll, I would bet that most outlets would do not have many veterans on staff because we know it statistically there are very few out there. You know, that's a disservice to your community, to your readership. So, um, you know, veterans know their community. They have the trust in their community. They can talk the lingo. They know, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a former sailor. I couldn't tell you anything about an M14. You know, I have no idea. You know, but but I know if, it, if I meet a, an, a, a, an army, former army grunt, I know how to communicate with that person. I know how to to, to, to receive their trust. I know some, some of the challenges they've gone through in, in veteran life, very likely. You know, I, I think there's when you have communities, you need to have somebody who's who's reporting on them, who is also from that community. And and so I, I think that's one thing. Veterans are also have a lot of great attributes, broadly speaking. They're willing to put in hard work, leadership skills, like I mentioned. Uh, veterans, uh, the ones that are involved in journalism who I've met, a lot of them are really critical of the military. Uh, I certainly have been in my journalism career. So I think that you know some some uh, journalists have expressed to me they believe that veterans might be too soft on the military. In fact, I've seen just the opposite. Um, so veterans have those skills; they have the network, and um, I think it, it would be uh, it's beneficial to the newsroom to get that diversity. It's also beneficial ultimately to the news consumers of a news outlet because they're going to bring bring some really deep reporting on these issues. Definitely, definitely. So if I'm a young person about to get out of the military and I want to start a civilian career in journalism, how should I get in touch with MVJ and what kinds of support would MVJ offer? Yeah, we've got a website which has everything you'd need to know about us. It's uh, www.mvj.network. Uh, check us out. You can also just Google Military Veterans and Journalism. Uh, and um, we have a ton of services and um, programs that veterans can get involved in. As I mentioned, we have fellowships. We've got a fantastic mentorship program. We have a range of training opportunities. We work with institutions like Pointer, as well as uh, City University of New York, CUNY. We have career fairs. We have an annual convention. We even issue press credentials as well for those who are just getting started. You know, we do all we can to support our community, give them unique opportunities. And so, yes, I absolutely encourage anybody who is interested in a career in journalism who's getting out of the military, or even if they've been out of the military 30, 40 years, you know, it's never too late. So uh, we welcome people to join our, our, our ranks. Well, many thanks for your time, Zach. We've been talking with Zach Badorf, Executive Director of Military Veterans in Journalism. I'm Tom Young, reporting for Update One from the National Press Club in Washington. You have been listening to Update One. 
the official podcast of the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists and a vigorous advocate of press freedom worldwide. If you have any questions or comments about Update One, send an email to update1podcast at gmail.com.